Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I sat down with Nancy Arms Simon, who is an art collections manager at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Arts. And we had such a cool conversation. Just to give you guys some background, I took Muni to SF MoMA and it was pouring raining and I got absolutely drenched. The situation was not looking good, but luckily I was able to make it and I was so glad I did because we had such a beautiful conversation that I'm really excited to share. Um, and yeah, if there's any feedback you guys would like to share with me in the comments, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. And without further ado, here's Atlas 017, Nancy Arms Simon. Divide some more of your meditation. For it gives our inspiration. Nancy, thanks so much for being on Atlas today. I'm really excited about today's episode. Thanks, me too. The first question that I had was, the great artist Pablo Picasso once said, art washes away from the soul, the dust of everyday life. What role would you say has art played in your life? Um, I think like a lot of people, um, you know, I started off, it, most of the artists that I know now um, will say the same thing that like, I started off making things, you know, just a sort of, I think that it starts as like a um, wanting something in your world. So you're either crafting something for like to play with or you're, or you're drawing a picture of something that, you know, it's the, any kind of expression of idea. There's something that you have in you and you want it to be there. And so you're sort of making it. And then I think what happens is there's sort of like a crossover where, um, where you start, you, you shift into like, defining and qualifying and quantifying your artwork and that's sort of like I've often thought about like well when is the, you know when is the point that you become an artist or that you like that you cross over into that definite defining yourself as an artist and um I think that's actually where a lot of people stop making art is when they start to compare themselves to other people or thinking that if they don't look, you know, if their work doesn't look like one of the masters, that somehow they're not, you know, that they shouldn't be doing it and that's some sort of waste of time or something. And I think that, um, and so for me, um, I think I struggled with that a little bit for a while and then just sort of landed on like, no, I need to make this stuff and I don't always know why, but I need to. Um, so there's sort of that part of it um, and then there's sort of the professional part of it. And I, at one point, um, you know, I had always been making things and, and things like that. And then um, I had gotten, my first degree was in German literature, actually, from UW-Madison. And I got done, and I, I didn't really know what I was doing after that. And I, um, and uh, I had just sort of, I you know, I was around a lot of artists at the time and just decided, you know, I'm just, I'm sick of, I was doing a lot of food service, um, gotten, getting kind of tired of waiting tables. And I d decided at some point, you know, I'm just going to get a job doing anything that art in art that somebody will pay me for. I don't want to take any classes because I don't want to have to pay for them. So there was a frame store not too far from my house. And, um, about once a week, I would walk by there and I'd go into the frame store and I'd say to the woman at the counter, are you guys hiring at all? And she would say no. And then I would go back and about a week later and say, are you guys hiring at all? And she'd say no. And then um, at some point, um, my boyfriend at the time had, an, had a, a show. They had a little gallery space in the frame store and he had a show there. And um, they were looking and eventually they were looking for somebody. I think I had stopped finally going by and bothering them all the time. Um, and, uh, she said, and they, one of the people that worked there said to the other, well, why don't we call that Nancy who keeps coming by here and asking about the job? Cause she clearly wants to work here. And they had my phone number because I lived with my boyfriend. So they called me and I started working in the frame store. And so, um, I think there was like a really conscious decision to, to work around art. And I didn't really know what that would look like, but I just was, that was just where I was going to start. And then that sort of that job led into um, working at a like a you know a fine artisans gallery in Wisconsin, and then um, wanting to move to California, and then getting into preparator work. And so there's sort of I mean I, I think that the that those two worlds feed into each other, but that they're not exactly the same thing. Getting a job in the arts is not the same as 
being an artist, but they can definitely inform each other. So there's so many things I want to touch on in that answer. Sure. The, the first was, you know, looking back, was there any experience of expression um, growing up that stands out to you that, you know, had a big impact on, on you as a person? Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind and for some reason, I always remember this, that um, I think I think one of the biggest impacts was realizing that not everybody else did it, that th- that I thought I thought everybody wanted to sit around and draw for hours, you know, um, and I had uh, there was a, a, f- a friend that lived down the street and um, her mother was frustrated that she didn't really want to do anything except watch TV. And and so she said, I'll take you to the craft store and I'll buy you anything you want. And I remember her saying, yeah, but I didn't really find anything. And I remember just saying to my mom, like, I just don't understand how you could go to that store and not find anything and sort of realizing like, oh, I guess I'm kind of different than other people. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I have to think about it more, about mm-hmm. whether there was any sort of like big aha moments in my own making. Um, I think it's like, it's less of like a, it's less of like a threshold and more of just sort of like a letting go of like expectations about what it's going to be. I mean, I really firmly believe that art is a, is it's about process. And I think that that's a hard thing to retain in a highly capitalist culture where we're really obsessed with these objects and about things being marketable. And um, there was actually, actually one of my big, I'll give you a good aha moment was um, I was a friend of mine who's a writer was in town. Um, She was doing, and we went to lunch with another writer. She was here doing a book tour um, and we were at lunch with another writer friend of hers. And when my friend went to the restroom, she, the other writer said to me, so are you a writer? And I was like, well, you know, I, I mean, I write, you know, I, I actually write, I write letters. I write, um, I write, things for myself I write you know but I was like but I'm not a writer like you like you are a writer and like like Anne is a writer and um and we had a really good conversation about just this idea of um what how we define being an artist or being you know in this case a writer in our culture because there's a there's an idea that if you are an amateur that that means that you are less than somehow um i think it comes probably from that old show you know the amateur hour but amateur means in french it means for the love of like you know it's it's about doing it for the love of it and that um and and that the idea is if you're good at, in our culture, I feel like a lot of times, if you're good at something, it means you're supposed to be professional, which means then you're supposed to make money from it. And mm-hmm. there isn't really, we don't really have a lot of like terms or places for that thing that's in between where it's, you no, know, this is just something that I need to do, want to do, passionate about, like you were saying about your own podcast. I, I need to have a creative outlet. This is, this is my creative outlet. And so, um, and then sort of being able to roam around in the unknown space of I'm just making and then and one project informs the next. Like, I think that was like a real key moment, even though it wasn't involved in my own making or my own career exactly. It was it was a real I think there was something really affirming about talking to that other writer and us us both sort of saying, yeah, it's it. you should just be doing it if you want to. And sometimes people will show me their art and they're sort of doing this like, well, what do you think about it? You know, like, and, and I always say, well, keep making. Like, mm-hmm. that's that's what this is about. It's about continuing making and uh, and setting up your life and your whatever to, to keep making. Um, it's, you kind of have to be okay. You kind of have to want to do it even if there isn't, um, like a an audience motive. or a product or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like you have to keep, there has to be something in it that you want that doesn't have to do with the end result. Yeah, I've heard Rick Rubin talk about how, um, in his perspective, like the audience comes last and like the, yeah. the right approach for him um, as far as creating art goes is art in the process of creating art is your relationship with it and you should make it for yourself like you are the audience. Right. And um, consideration for, for, for what the audience might think about the art is typically where great art goes to die because you're sort of making a product, you're thinking about the marketing of it, and yeah. it makes you really blind and sort of like puts up a roadblock to the path that might lead to making something that's innovative or honest or authentic. 
Okay, so first of all, I love Rick Rubin. Mm -hmm. Absolutely love him. And and I and I totally agree that there is a um that there's that if you're starting with the audience, you're probably trying to create something that's um a duplicate of something that's already there. Mm -hmm. And that that is not where it can come from. That's not where the art world doesn't even know what it wants next because it doesn't exist yet. So yeah. you can't once not that you can't emanate people or be part of a conversation that's about a certain type of work or a certain theme or things like that but like it it has to come from inside of you there you can't you can't be looking down the road at you know well how will this be received yeah and i along with other people my age sort of entering adulthood right now it's a challenge but a, a fun challenge sort of developing an approach to creative pursuits and I think you need to be really strategic about it. You know, like if I take Atlas um, podcast, for example, it's like, okay, do I want to make money from this? Then that shifts how I should approach mm -hmm. this problem. Because if I do need to make money, if I do want to make money from it, then there needs to be a consideration for what the market might want and how I can provide value. Or if I want it to just be a personal project, then you're sort of like left to your own devices. You can do whatever um, feels right to you without consideration for how the product or art you're creating might play out in the market. And, you know, that's just like one example of a small, dis, uh, you know, variation and approach that has a real consequential impact in what would be the best way for you to like carry out your creative pursuit. And what skills? Yeah. Are you going to develop money making skills and marketing skills or are you going to develop? I just really want to try this new kind of video filter on this and I just want to see what that looks like. Yeah. And, and neither one is wrong. It's just it's it's different. Yeah. And even going back to, um, you know, making art for the audience. I had a marketing class this fall semester um, and the professor touched a lot on market research mm -hmm. and it was really striking to me seeing how um, involved and like important or just like the, the importance levied on like the perspective of the customer. It's mm -hmm. like these guys would spend hundreds of thousands right. of millions of dollars just to find out what it is exactly the audience wanted. And mm -hmm. that was it really painted like an extreme example of what you know in a creative pursuit what consideration for the artist might look like to the absolute extreme sure and i, I think I, i'm not sure if maybe this has came up sometimes um you know looking back through your personal experience but it there seems to be a lot of value in um identifying and, and sort of like evaluating extremes of whatever topic or whatever it, whatever issue you're sort of thinking about because i think it provides a lot of um valuable information or it maybe offers the opportunity to, to sort of like crystallize a lot of principles that underlie whatever topic or like concept you're, mm -hmm. you're thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, what was I going to say? I, th I mean, I think that there's a, there is definitely a place for marketing, obviously. Um, I just don't know. And I, and I, and there has to be a place where marketing and innovation meet. And I don't know that if that's studying what the audience wants. I mean, if you're trying to, again, like if you're trying to create a product, that someone is going to buy, then yes, that audience input is key, right? Because you don't want to make a chair that nobody wants to sit in. So, okay. But if what you're trying to do is pure self-expression, then that's that's that other end of it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'm answering your question. No, yeah, but, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, another thing to think about is we all have to, I think, at least my perspective, we all have to be sort of honest as to, like, how good we want to get at whatever pursuit we take on mm -hmm. you know for some people maybe the way they're wired just being pretty competent and earning a living is what would result in the the most um, fulfilling and happy life for them mm -hmm. but other people they're sort of born with this drive where they need to be excellent and they're more than happy to make the sacrifice of like maybe having a family or having a ton of interpersonal relationships because the way they're wired you know being excellent in their pursuit is just that important to them in their psychology right um one one way that I think this sort of manifests itself in creative pursuits is that when I think about the best artists, um, you know, my favorite artist is, is Kanye West or, or mm. Travis Scott, people like that. I think they're great because they're daring. Like they're great because whenever I've, you know, looked back at a Kanye West album release, you know, I think about graduation or late registration mm -hmm. or college dropout. All of those albums, there was very little consideration, it seemed like, for what the audience wanted. It was mm -hmm. almost like he's bold enough to make whatever music he wants and he's bold enough to say i don't care what the audience thinks mm -hmm. and only in that sort of like approach to creative pursuits can like greatness actually manifest itself um when you think about sort of the approach you've taken to creative pursuits and i heard you sort of allude to um you know it seemed you were very determined to make art central to to your professional life and how you made money 
Could you speak to sort of maybe the importance of being determined and to those young people listening? Mm -hmm. um, any words of advice on if they want to make art an important, critical role in their professional journey? What um, teachings, learnings, lessons would you say you've learned along the way in order to make that a reality? Um, I do... Uh, I do tours of um, some of the, the spaces here at the museum, and um, there's, that question gets asked a lot. And I have, I have two sort of key answers for people who want to be creative, um, and this is just a starting point. But I think that um, the mentality that I go through life with is that you get to pick one most important thing at any given time in your life, and you have to decide what that most important thing is. And... Um, so if it's going to be art making, you have to understand that you may have to give up other things. And if that isn't worth it, if, if, if say for example, you realize that you can't make art and also have a kid because real estate in San Francisco is really expensive, okay? Mm -hmm. So I can either have a studio in that room or I can have a kid in that room. Okay, that's a, that's, that's a, what are you going to choose moment? Now, if you're really lucky, you might get a couple of your top most things. Mm. But, there come, but most of the time, it seems like you have to have a single vision of what your most important thing is. And the other thing I would say is that, I've owned, that I kind of came to realize later in life is just how important it is to have, and I think this is a way that having a job in the arts in a museum or something like that can be really beneficial is um, having people around you who understand art making and the need for it. Um, having those people that you speak that same language with there, there is um, also often a myth in our culture of like artists being this, you know, this solo drug addicted you know, manic behavior off in a barn somewhere painting, you know, all alone. Um, but that is, but that really doesn't take into account. It's, it's sort of a Hollywood myth in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and it doesn't take into account, um, how much we feed off of each other and the ability to say, you know, just having people around you that you don't have to explain that, um, you, um, no, I'm going to my studio tonight that I'm not, that I don't have to say, it's not, I don't have a class, I don't have to work, I don't have a previous obligation. It's just, this is actually something that I'm ju I just do for myself and that they don't wonder what that is. Or having friends that say like, oh, what are you working on right now? Mm -hmm. Like that feels really good to just, and, and I think that there can be a lot of um, things that get germinated just in talking to other people about your work and what you're doing. And there's always sort of that like little bit of a problem solving thing that you're working on and you're, you know, to be able to talk through that can be really helpful. So I think having some kind of community of people around you, however you make it, whether it's your, you know, colleagues or, you know, you have like a certain art movement and, you know, you think about like the mission school artists, like they all had each other. Um, and I also think that those worlds sort of, um, they germinate really organically and you, you can't necessarily make them happen, but to be looking for that. Is yeah. What I, I haven't had a lot of um, friendships or relationships with people that um, work in creative spaces. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what do you think those relationships with fellow artists and, you know, conversations that I'd imagine you'd have about the importance of art and the impact art can have on, on, on communities. What do you think those relationships have taught you about the importance of art just on a societal level. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if you've heard of, I think it's like Plato, it's something to do with Plato. It was in my philosophy class. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, uh, we were learning sort of just like an exercise in society building and how like Greek philosophers thought uh, what would be the best, most optimal way to build a society and how sort of like conservatism and conservative individuals or risk averse individuals sort of congregate in the middle. But, you know, even though that's important because risk aversion is important in some situations mm -hmm. in the borders and in the fringes where the artists and those are the people that explored and came in with innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of this idea of like what a cohesive society looks like is sort of like a balance between the two. Mm, yeah. What do you think, you know, speaking with people on those fringes of art, what do you think that's taught you about the role art plays in society? Mm, from talking to those people on the fringes, what role does art have in our society um i mean if you talk you know if you talk to the really far out ones 
they tend to, um, I think that it shows you like that they, they live in a more, in a place without boundaries, you know, that like, it, like it amazed, I mean, I, I think of myself as a pretty creative thinker. And yet when I talk to people who are sort of living in the art space, there, it's like they, there are no boundaries to the, to the possibilities. Um, one of the, I went uh, actually this summer to go see um, Frank Lloyd Wright's uh, Taliesin in Wisconsin. He had two Taliesins. One was in Wisconsin. One was, I think, in Arizona. It was in the desert. Anyway, um, one of the things they talked about um, on the tour was um, he had a bunch of shells sitting next to a window, and um, he would use them as teaching aids. And one of the, but and the, there's no real proof that he said this while holding a shell. But he said he said you know when you're when he would say to his students like when you're choosing to be an architect, realize you know that that a that a snail lives in a shell. Like that, that a house can be something you've never even imagined before. Mm -hmm. We get very locked into like our idea of what a house is. So I, I think like the, the artists that live really, f they, they see the connections between everything and that, um, and they can come up with the most, um, the most creative solutions because they're sort of untethered to, to like what all of our preconceived notions are. One of the, like there's a really typical, um, uh, drawing exercise that you'll do in, in like in drawing classes where they'll, um, they'll do a still life, but they'll flip everything upside down because your concept of what something looks like, um, you're trying to break that. You're trying to just break what you're looking at into planes of color, planes of shadow and light and things like that. And so you're trying, like you're trying to turn your brain so that it's not looking at a chair, it's looking at just a shape. And so, like, I mean, that's like a, that's like a tiny starting place for how artists think about the world. It's like, and the, and, um, yeah, and the more that they live in it, you know, I, I worked on the um, Solowit retrospective that was here um, in 2000, and one of the, and uh, so I was one of the people drawing, doing wall drawings here. And um, so it was five weeks, it was about, nine or 10 hours a day. And I think I had two days off in that time. And like the place that my brain went during that time was like completely removed from like whether I had opened my mail or whether the trash had gotten taken out. Like mm -hmm. I was just in a completely different place. And that was actually what made me want to go back to school and study painting. Cause I, I just, I just wanted to be in that place in my brain. Mm -hmm. Um, more of the time, if I, if not all the time, I wanted to go and live there for a little bit. So I feel like artists just, they bring something back from the place where they li live. And if they're sharing it with us, um, there's a real power in that. You know? Yeah. You bring up something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially because Kanye being my favorite artist, mm -hmm. I see this sort of play out with the way he sort of treated and talked about. I think I put a lot of value in divergent thinking. I feel like mm -hmm. divergent thinking is what leads to the creation of an iPhone or the creation of SpaceX and, you know, the excitement that that gives to young people, you know, thinking about, you know, they might be able to go to Mars in the future, maybe their kids or grandkids, right? And when I think about an individual like Kanye, right, I think when artists, the value they give is divergent thinking. And there needs to be compassion for a person that explores ideas whom some of we might have a lot of admiration for and some we might have a lot of distaste for. Because part of the risk you take in considering and evaluating and exploring ideas whom people might regard as dangerous or useless or lacking in sympathy or ideas that just aren't touched. There's value in that because there's innovative solutions that can be brought from that. There's insights where you can derive from that, but you also run the risk of maybe adopting certain beliefs or having certain perspectives momentarily that um, may have a negative impact on the world. Is that something you sort of thought of with artists? Because I really think there's like a lack of compassion for people that are brave enough to sort of um, take on a creative pursuit where they explore ideas that others are too, maybe cowardly isn't the comp most compassionate word I could use, but um, that other people don't take on because they want to be safe, they want to maintain their status, they're scared of how others might perceive them. And to the select few individuals, I think, in society, you know, being artists who have the bravery to explore a lot of those ideas, I think we don't do a great job as a society in expressing compassion for those individuals and sort of fostering that 
um, impetus to like participate in divergent thinking because I do think there aren't many people that have the bravery to participate in that thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of value that we derive from that we may not recognize on our day to day. Mm. Yeah, I mean, um, I... I think it's an. I think it's a. It's a great. It's a great topic, and it's one that I think about a lot. Which is just the way that um, we we have a hard time in our culture accepting that people contain multitudes and that people are complicated, and that um, every time that we are shocked that um, someone who is famous has done something that we don't like, I, I'm. I'm always a little baffled. I'm like, no one ever said that they didn't have a dark side or something, or that like, you know, just because you're an amazing filmmaker doesn't mean you're not gonna also maybe sleep with your daughter, mm -hmm. which is frowned upon in our culture. But like that, and, and then the way that we then say, okay, well now we have to write them off as a bad, so we write them off as a bad person and then somehow, and then somehow, we refuse to um, we we cut off we cut off their art at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I think, I mean, there's a there's a great book that just came out that I haven't completely read, but um, it's called Monsters, I think, and um, it's about this topic exactly. It's mm -hmm. about it's about like um, the idea of like where it, where is the line with people? And I think. I think that if we could all be a little bit more um, broad-minded in the way that we think about what we what our expectations of people who become famous are, I think that everybody has to make that decision for themselves. If you never want to listen to a Kanye West song again mm -hmm. because of something that he said, you can totally do that. You can you don't ever have to listen to Kanye West again, um, and and I don't know that it's always. I don't know that artists even always feel like they're being brave. I think they don't, I think that it's their truth. Hmm. In the moment or whatever, it's their truth and it's what they're feeling. And and the bravery comes in maybe saying it out loud, but I don't even know if those people ever even feel brave when they're saying it. I bet they feel scared yeah. and then they say it anyway. And, um, and I wish there was a lot more, a lot more room for, um, spectrum thinking and non-binary thinking and just um, allowing things to be multiple things at the same time. Um, one of the things that I, that also informs like my attitudes about art is just that um, I'm, you know, I come from a mixed background and art for me is a real, it's, um, they talk about, you know, the third space that you have to create for yourself when you're a mm -hmm. mixed person and that like, um, Art is a third space for me because it's a place where I get to exist solely as myself, mm -hmm. um, and I think there just needs to be more. There needs to be more room where we let people be all of the things that they are at the same time. Um, so and yeah, um, I definitely yeah. I, I, I just like I was thinking about this scene in that and there's that Kanye movie where he yeah. um, where he go he walks into one of the record producer the studios and he he like he's like i'm gonna i'm gonna rap for you and he takes out his his mouth guard mm -hmm. he like takes out his retainer he's like Before i gotta take out my retainer and he sets it on the table and i was just like whoa yeah this guy isn't even paying attention to the rules like mm -hmm. there he didn't even think to put it in his pocket he's not thinking about that's really gross that you set that on the secretary he's just he's there in the moment and he's doing his thing and he can't be stopped and so like and like, it was like, it was, I mean, and also it was just sort of so sweet and almost like kind of childlike in that mm -hmm. moment. Um, you know, I have problems with the things that he said too, but um, that, you know, I still love it when my put, husband puts on good morning in yeah. the morning for me, you know, like it's, um, I don't think that negates the creativity that he's had. Um, and I, and I think, you know, and I, and also just like speaking about, I just, I see him as a person who's who has some pain too, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, hurt people hurt people sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, my personal perspective on Kanye is, you know, I I do think he says things that are insensitive or mm -hmm. um, may come across as like mean or childish sometimes. But I think if we all just sort of like take a step back and evaluate, you know, all the people that we sort of cast away as bad people, it's like at the end of the day, 
you know, the worst thing Kanye did was like said something that was hurtful, mm -hmm. you know, but there's people that do a lot crazier things in this world. Right. So right. to have compassion for a person who already, you know, in their profession is uh, taking it upon themselves to participate in divergent thinking. And I think who has provided a lot of insights throughout his career mm -hmm. to, to have a little bit compassion for him. And, you know, even going back to, to the, the scene you mentioned with Pharrell. No, it's not only crazy that he took off his mouth guard and put it on there and didn't have consideration for it. It's also crazy that we have footage of it because he wasn't even like popular at the time. I know. So like not only was he like um, energetic enough to like put his mouthpiece on, he was like energetic enough to have a guy following him around his right. camera recording the documentary. Right. It was, yeah. It was crazy. It was really crazy. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I... I don't want the whole conversation to be about Kanye, but he's a complicated <laughs> guy. And, um, and, you know, and he, and also he's the one who has to face Adidas shoes and he has to face his record producer. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, um, and that's, to me, that's, um, there's some punishment in that, that he's receiving. Mm -hmm. It is, it has made him unmarketable. Okay, yeah. so I don't have to buy his records if I don't like what he says. Nobody has to buy his records if they don't like what he says. Um, and he has to, that's, that's his own, um, you know, it's, that's between him and, and, you know, whether he can make a living. Yeah. Like, so again, coming back to the thing we had at the beginning of like, well, Kanye, was it more important for you to market your art, your art or was it more important for you to make your art? Well, it was more, in that moment, you decided it was more important for you to say what you had in your heart, that you had in your mind, okay? Mm -hmm. And you gave up the marketing choice then. Yeah. Yeah, I think our conversation about the importance of divergent thinking brings up um, something really important in the way that I sort of evaluate art and have also observed in the way people talk about people in the past or just people in the present. Um, when I think about artists, every artist that I've met or have watched interviews of, they seem like the most open and compassionate to the mistakes of others. Mm -hmm. They're like, the, they seem to be the first people who recognize that we're all human, we're all imperfect, and we all make mistakes. And that's something that I really admire about artists on top of like their courage to participate in divergent thinking and sort of like explore um, what most are not courageous enough to explore. And well, and just let me add too, yeah. like, I think it's courageous to follow your art. Mm -hmm. You don't know where it's going to lead you. And you don't know what's going to happen with it. And like, you know, I, I love the band X. And one of the things I always, I always think about when I'm listening to them, I was like, they've been following their music for, you know, 40 years now or something. And, and they just kept following it through mm -hmm. like good times and bad. Like that alone is like really, that alone is really courageous to even just follow, to follow what you need to do next. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there were a lot of, you know, missed family holidays and things like that, that they had to, you know, cause they were doing a concert or something like mm. all of those little day-to-day -day decisions. Um, to me, that's about like, you know, choosing, choosing the freedom to make your work in those moments that that's a lot of bravery. Too. Yeah. And I think a lot of the value that art, whether it be paintings, music, books, letters, people write is I think it sort of opens up a portal for me to learn more about the lived experience of others who, mm -hmm. you know, we can contrast very distinctly with, you know, our lived experience now. And one thing that I've observed and is, I found pretty disheartening in my generation, but I'm sure it's been around since, you know, the beginning of time is, I think people, when they look back at history, they approach it with this sort of like moral superiority of mm -hmm. like, oh, like I would have never yeah. had this like <laughs> racist belief or I would have never uh, been a part of this government or I would have never... Um, you know, thought this about this person or done this or participated in this exploration or colonization. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the really cool things about art, you know, when you watch a painting made in the 1500s, it's like, we don't know what it's like to live in that time, you know? Right. And I'm very skeptical of how much morality we sort of like attribute to ourselves. And I do think a lot of times it's really cheap morality because I don't think we really find out if we're if um, the morals we have are really our morals until they're tested. And there's so much sort of morals that we assume are ours and we've never had to like test them or stand up for them or pay a price for them or sacrifice something for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I see a painting, I think it was the 3rd of May by Goya. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was like a rebellion writer yeah. in, in Spain. When I see something like that, it's like, wow, like 
that's like the human experience, right? Like this is something that happened over and over again, just like violence. Right. And it'd be very easy for me now, you know, growing up in East Bay and sure, you know, I'm not like affluent background, but pretty comfortable. I have heating, mm-hmm. I had food, I, you know, I went to school, I got an education. It it'd be, seems very easy for me to sort of like look at that and be like, oh, I'd never participate in violence like that. Mm-hmm. But I think art serves as like a great reminder for me of uh, my humanity and my imperfection. Mm-hmm. Um, when you evaluate art, is that something you sort of take into consideration? Maybe something that you've, um, some value that you've derived in your time mm, managing About art? subject matter or about... Yeah, maybe about the lessons art has taught you about your own humanity mm-hmm. and the human experience and human nature. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about, um, you know, my first degree was in um, German literature and um, I studied in Germany a couple of times and I, um, I still have a lot of connections there and things. And, you know, obviously Germans, everybody, you know, first thing everybody thinks about is Nazis and, um, and, and I think that's a very good example of, of our moral superiority about how I would never do that. Um, and I think like, you know, if you look at like the like the drawings of Kathy Kolwitz or something like that, and you look at what it means to be a mother who is watching her child starve, mm-hmm. um, I don't. I like to think I would do the right thing. I, but I also know that if you if I was put in a situation where it was, you know, God forbid, feeding my child or turning in my neighbor, mm-hmm. I want to believe I do the right thing. I really do. Mm-hmm. I don't know, though. And I also think that there's a really good, um, yeah, and you look at, yeah, just looking at those drawings and thinking about that. But I but I think there's also, I, I read a really great book recently where, um, where a mother asked her daughter, a little kid, uh, do you think we would do the right thing in this situation? And I don't remember which atrocity of man's inhumanity to man that they were talking about, but she said, she said, no, we wouldn't. And she says, why don't you think we do the right thing? And she said, because we're not doing the right thing right now. Mm-hmm. There are atrocities right now going on all the time. And, um, and I often think about, like, you know, what am I doing? What am I doing about any of it? And I, and I often feel like I, um, you know, I, yeah, that I would, you know, I'd like to think that I'm doing the right thing. But, you know, and sometimes I'll think, like, well, what if, like, what would it take, you know, to, it for everybody to have a warm place to sleep. Like, what if I found out that if I just, if we all just gave up one couch in our house, every single person would have a warm place to live. Like, would I do that? Would I, be, would I give up the couch in my living room? I don't know. I like to think I would, but I don't know. I don't, you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it's so easy. It's so easy to judge and so hard to do the right thing. And there is all kinds of, um, inhumanities going on right now and and here i am sitting in my fancy museum in the quiet out of the rain gonna go home to my house and sleep in a warm bed and probably eat a dinner you Mm -hmm. know yeah yeah i've heard um conversations with people that may have more conservative personalities and Mm -hmm. heard them express skepticism of sort of the value of art and why the Mm -hmm. government should spend money on art or just different conversations we hear Mm -hmm. um in passing And I think if there was one thing that I think art provides society is I think it's a window to compassion because Mm -hmm. I think that's the one thing art has given me. It's just, I love art. I love Mm -hmm. music. I love paintings. And if I were to sort of just think from first principles, like what impact has consuming and supporting art given me? I think it's compassion through like, do you feel like it's from feeling emotion just by absorbing art Mm -hmm. or is there a message in art that you've been experiencing that has given you like Hmm. where is that coming from i think i think i've had experiences both of those types of experiences Mm -hmm. i mean kanye is like my favorite artist i mean i don't want to make the conversation all about (laughs) kanye but every single time i think about art it just goes back to him because he has such a big big impact on me growing Mm -hmm. up and i think you know like i was a kid and you know you sort of go through this cycle where you're like naive and then you're cynical and then you arrive at optimism hopefully right Mm -hmm. and you know when you're a kid and you're naive and i love kanye and then all of a sudden um around like 2016 2017 time was when um people started having very negative attitudes about kanye this is my favorite artist right Mm -hmm. and you know i was in what middle school maybe beginning high school around 2016 2017 time so 
I, um, it taught me a lot about the imperfection of human beings. Like, I love this person. I love the art they made. But they're imperfect just like I'm imperfect. Yeah. And oh. undergoing that realization, then it's like, I look at a painting and it's like, oh, wow, like, every art piece of art I consume, whether it be a painting, a letter, yeah. a video, an interview, um, a podcast, it's like all of it is just outlining the imperfection of humanity. And, you know, there's a lot of pain, suffering, evil, uh-huh. uh, um, you know, a lot of bad things in that imperfection. But I think there's also the opportunity to do good because if everything was perfect, there wouldn't be an opportunity to be good. It's almost like morality is impossible yeah. in, in, um, in a perfect world. And well, and you can always spot those people that are still nestled in cynicism, mm-hmm. because when you talk, if you talk about somebody, I remember when, um, so I'm a massive Prince fan, like yeah. massive. And when he, and when he died, you know, there's a couple of people that were like, well, I, you know, I, I heard he was a Jehovah's witness and that like, he didn't, you know, he refused to celebrate his birthday or something, you know? And I was like, yes. And mm-hmm. And how, like, how in the world could you take a musician like that and, and like zero in on one part, you know, as if, and it also just as if that was a bad thing, right? But, mm-hmm. but nonetheless, if it was something, you know, like that is not all of who he was. I would think that that vault full of music would be an indication that there is something more going on than, you know, whatever his spiritual belief was at the time or whatever. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just, no, no. like, I feel like there are, there, it's almost like people want to like, it's like, yeah, like you, your idea, like, I really love how you phrase the, that, you know, cause I definitely did the same thing, mm-hmm. you know, idealistic, um, you know, cynical and then found my way to optimism and hope. And like, I think that when somebody's trapped in cynicism, they think that you're still stuck in idealism. Mm. It's like, no, no, no. I went through cynicism. Mm. I got to hope because I realized how much harder it is to be hopeful and optimistic than it is to be cynical is like really easy. Mm-hmm. It's super easy. It's cheap. It doesn't take oh, work. Oh, and it's and it's it, there's so many things to be cynical about mm-hmm. all the time, every day. I love your example about sort of like this idealistic comment about Prince, mm-hmm. and I I view that whenever I come into contact with that, I view that it's like oh, it's like such a, a corrosive um, sort of like sentiment or corrosive uh, way of existing that like permeates itself through society. And it's like, that's why art is important because art combats that. And like, yeah. that's why we need museums and that's why we need to support kids in art because all of these realizations that um, combat that like corrosive idealistic behavior yeah. is, uh, I think a lot of those experiences are born, whether it be in arts and crafts class, a music class, yeah. whether it be in the way kids consume art, um, the way kids talk about art. It's, um, I think that's what I'd say it's a value. What would you say from your experience would be like the one value proposition about art in communities? Well, I think the, the, the key one to me, if you're, if you're going to really get into this idea that like art has to serve something, which Mm -hmm. I sort of, you know, already don't like fully follow, but let's go there. Um, I, I feel like, um, you know, any kind of art is an expression of an idea and it's, it's talking in a different language. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's giving it gives people another language to express themselves in besides the one or two that we use mm-hmm. every day. And so to me, you're allowing people's voices to come forward. You're giving them tools for their voices to come forward and for their ideas to come forward. Um, and it might be somebody who might never get, you know, proper English grammar down. And that's fine, but because they've got this other language and it could be, you know, it could be music, it could be a podcast, it could be whatever that, you know, you're, you're allowing people to communicate mm-hmm. and, um, and ever you know, and people, people want to feel seen. They want to, they want to feel like, you know, I think most people want to be heard. They want to be seen. They want to know that, um, that their ideas matter and that they're not just shouting into a void and so you're giving people tools to do that. Not to mention just like another tool to like learn history by and things like that. Um, yeah. You know, that if we want people to understand our histories and not make mistakes again, and that, you know, this is yet another tool. I mean, to me, looking at art, looking at art history books is just like, it's like, it's all there. 
everything. And it's not only in like the picture that you see of Goya's, um, you know, the one of, of, you know, shooting the rebellers, the Mm -hmm. people rebelling, but like, also there are, there are less, if you go deeper, there's lessons about the type of paint that he was using and what was available to people and what's in the soil and what, you know, um, you know, how big, you know, how big you could stretch a canvas in that day as opposed to how big you can stretch a canvas now. You know, one of the, like, you know, one of the reasons that um, you look at old mirrors and they have like these really ornate edges with lots of little pieces of mirror, it's because you could only make mirrors so big. Mm -hmm. And so you would create these little edges. So there's like a history, there's a, there's the history of like wherever, whatever period this thing came from and all that. But there's also lessons about like the physical object that's even that's even more that can be a portal for people to learn about science and about geology and about you know all of these other things the, you know we didn't have oil paints you know petroleum paints until you know whatever after world war ii when that became like a thing or um so um anyway i just i feel like it's it's such it's su- it's such an obvious portal to learn so many things and to help us have a more you know, educated and informed public. Mm -hmm. Um, And you get more joy out of life. The more you understand things, you know, the more you, you are appreciating each moment. Like, and there's nothing wrong with happiness. Happiness is not some sort of, well, you're only supposed to have happiness after you've done all the other things. It's like, that should be incorporated into everything, so. Yeah, I'm curious too, to to cover, you know, your work doing art collections management. Mm, Yeah, yeah. Um, to those of us who um, are unfamiliar with, you know, the role of art collections management, how would you describe sort of your day to day here at MoMA? Um, so, collections manager, uh, I am primarily in charge of collections care and access. So, one part of that is um, working with, you know, we're a large organization and we have a lot of specialists here. So, I work with the different all the different colleagues here to make sure that the care of the work is is um, is the best that it can be, you know, within reason, within our resources. Um, that often has to do with, um, you know, just a series of practices as far as like, you know, baseline condition reporting, housing the object, um, reviews of the object, um, and then then the other part is about access to the objects. And so that's about evaluating all of the different types of requests that come in to see um, what it's going to take to make that work accessible. Mm-hmm. You know, what is the need? What are we preparing it for? And then what what is the lift and, and how can we make that happen? Um, we like to say yes mm-hmm. when we can. So you come into contact with a lot of, you know, the paintings that people pay a ton of money to come here and, and witness like firsthand through your role. Yeah. Um, any so, experience of seeing one and just being like blown away? Oh, out? oh, so many, so many. And actually, um, when I, not long after I started here, um, I said to a colleague in registration, I was like, do you ever, do you ever get past that moment? Like, and she's like, no, not really. Like mm-hmm. you're always, you know, there's, there's just so many things that you sort of stand in awe of. Um, I there when I did first did a tour of the collection center where I work more of the time um they they used to have more like they we have these art screens are basically like big screens that you pull out it's to it's to keep everything sort of contained more tightly and Mm -hmm. um they used to sort of curate those or design them a little bit better and um and she pulled out this art screen and it just it had I don't know I remember specifically that there was a Joseph Albers on the screen but it was just I mean, I, I, I felt my knees buckle. Like I felt myself just, just sort of, oh, you know, this, um, because, I, and I might be getting trippy, but like, I really feel like um, a lot of artwork, you know, it, it has like this, this energy that comes off of it. And, and I think I notice it most with older paintings because it's like, it's like, how can that thing still be giving me a vibe? Like, mm-hmm. like that artist is like dead and gone and still, you know? Um, and so anyway, yeah, um, I've definitely had many, many moments like that. Um, and I think what's really fun too is like when you open something and, um, and you look at it and you're sort of, you're sort of like, huh, I don't, 
mm, uh, I don't know. I don't. And then and then you come around to it. It's kind of almost even better. Mm -hmm. um, I really love looking at the backs of paintings too, which is one of the big bonuses of our jobs is that we get to. Um, what is there to see in the back? So on the back, you'll have not only you know artist signatures, um, artist dates. Um, you'll see how the stretcher was built, how the artist like built the canvas. But then also you have all of the um, you know for a really old painting, you're going to have several like you know. Um, gallery labels, museum labels, all of the different people who owned it at different times will all be there. And, you know, some of these go back, you know, maybe a hundred years. So um, there's something sort of like ooh, mm -hmm. fun about that too. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's always, a, you know, a little like that. I, unfortunately, I spend a lot of my time looking at thumbnails of paintings on a computer screen because um, mm -hmm. I'm mostly just trying to organize like workflows and things like that. But um yeah, I try to get out without hovering over people too much. I try to get out into the, into the gallery, into the vault. I, I really like looking at works in the vault because you can, um, you can get so much closer, and it just feels a little bit more, um, I don't know, less sort of perfect or something. Um, yeah, and I have, and and also like there's a couple. There's a painting by Norman Norman Zamet. His last name is Zamet. I can't remember what his if his first name's Norman, I think it is. But like, like I love that painting. It's just this great, it's just these gradations of color. And man, I love that thing so much. And when, you know, it's, it's quite large. And um, the, you know, so you see, you see a picture. I mean, it's kind of like this with art history books. Like you see a picture of it, but then when you're standing in front of it, like, you know, you can smell the paint and you it's can- It's three dimensional. It's three dimensional and you're like, you know, it's, it's like bigger than you. And you, you, you know, it's almost like you could just walk into it or something. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes it'll be like, you know, something that I really love will get pulled back out. Um, you know, or you just, you know, you stand in front of like, you know, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera's wedding portrait and, and you're just, you know, you're going, wow, she stood right here, like right in front of this, like as far away as I am right now, she stood here and, you know, and reached out with her brush and made this happen. I so. got to go to their house in, in one of Oh, Casa Azul. Oh. That's even crazier because oh. then you're like right there where they lived. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I love visiting um, artist homes and artist studios. It's really. It's any, any artist homes stand out? Well, I did go. I went to Frank Lloyd Wright's home. Um, this past summer, and I also went to Paisley Park this summer, um, Prince's studio and home, and then um, and and it was interesting too because I feel like um, the and also many years I've also I'm also a pretty big Elvis fan. Used to be a bigger Elvis fan, still am. Um, went to Graceland a couple of times, and I just find it really interesting um, when artists are allowed to sort of make their Shangri La like what what are the commonalities and like what what are they and a lot of times what i notice is um they'll go back to things from their childhood like a lot of times it's like a manifestation of something that they love that they're just like you know frank lloyd wright built taliesin on the side of a hill mm -hmm. um he loved this hill and he would go he would go he was supposed to go work on his uncle's farm every summer but he didn't want to work um, so he would sit on top of the hill and avoid working all day. And he would just say, this is, this is it. This, this sitting on this hill is, is my perfect place. And when he built his house, he didn't want to ruin the hill. He said, if you put a house on top of a hill, it's not a hill anymore. So he built it a, out of like respect for this hill that he loved so much as a kid, you know? Um, and, you know, and like, and Graceland, like Elvis loved, he loved Christmas. He loved having friends over. He loved, he loved those times when like you, because he grew up really poor, he loved feeling like there was plenty and he loved sharing that and he loved, you know, um, so I, I just think it's interesting how people sort of go back to, I think that there's, you know, that thing that we've talked about, about going into what your own truth is, or your own creativity. Like, I think a lot of that we develop in childhood and um, and then we kind of forget it a lot. But I think it, 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 everything tends to be like a manifestation of something that really hit you when you were little and you kind of never lost. Um, I have another story about that, but we should keep going. Yeah, and even going back to um, in the beginning of our conversation where you're talking about sort of this experience, a lot of people have, um, as they're coming to age where 
they sort of lose that ability to express themselves freely. Mm. Something I've been thinking a lot about, and I think, you know, when you're young, you're sort of like naive enough to think that lack of understanding is safe. It's really cool. It's like you got to go to class and you lack understanding and that makes for a really fun day. Mm -hmm. And then as you grow up, you sort of learn it. It it does seem sort of like a reasonable assumption to make, but I think it's one that you need to be very careful with, which is lack of understanding means, means danger. And that's why sort of like the presentation of your lack of understanding meets danger too. You know, if you don't understand maybe how contracts work and you're going to get a lease, it's like maybe you should understand a little bit about how leases work, right? Sure, sure. So, you know, just for like basic survival, it's uh, an important assumption to have present sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, and that, that is where I would categorize it, you know, with like cynicism. But I think arriving at optimism is sort of realization where like there needs to be um, moments in life where you're content with lacking an understanding and you're willing to explore that. Mm -hmm. And I think arriving at that place is where um, a lot of artists are at when they begin their careers and they sort of like chain them, uh, free themselves from the chains of like not being able to express themselves freely. And even going back to your description of um, a lot of these artists, artists' houses, I think that's sort of maybe what they're getting at is like when I was a kid, I was naive enough to just express myself freely. Uh And I want to like cultivate that feeling I had as a kid by like designing my house sort of as the environment like resonates what it was like to be a kid at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I always wanted a purple room, so I'm going to have a purple room now or mm-hmm. something. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, and, and to be fair, like it's hard to balance those things, you know? And I feel like as we become adults, so much of what we're expected to do feels overwhelming. And there's almost this like, well, well, I have to shed all those other things because I, I got to learn all this stuff for being an, an adult. But like... Um, like allowing yourself time to learn things just and be curious um, and, and like and accept and also just being OK with being uncertain and, and you know, uncertainty and um, not knowing and that things can change and all of that, like resting in that place. Like it, it takes a lot to get comfortable there. Mm-hmm. You know, I struggle with it. I think most people do. Yeah. And especially when you feel like the world is like moving really pl- fast and you have all these responsibilities and that it, and that if you, you know, I was just talking with a really good friend of mine about how like, um, there's often that feeling that if I, that if I, if I don't keep holding on tight to everything that it's like, I'm going to like, it's, it's all going to fall apart. And so you're sort of like rejecting all of these, anything that you've either been told or have somehow made up your mind that it's like, you know, frivolous or disposable or something like that, it's really easy to give that stuff up mm-hmm. when you're trying to hold it together, you know, and hold together life. And like, this is a difficult place to live. Mm-hmm. It's really difficult. And so it's easy to just sort of get like, no, no, got to just stick to my schedule, got to do my thing, got to, you know, stay on top of everything. And um, there just isn't a lot of time. Yeah, I think you see that a lot in like Stoic philosophy. And it is interesting, like Mm -hmm. human beings have sort of like this desire to just feel certain about things. And it's just like, we just can't feel certain, right? It's like, there's so much out of our control. And um, I think it's something I struggle with, you know, just like growing up, it's like uncertainty. And, you know, you only want to take on pursuits where success is like, probability is pretty high, right? Right. And a lot of those pursuits are like pretty low resolution, maybe just things that don't mean the most to you, given your psychology, Mm -hmm. because if they did mean a lot to you, the probability of success may not be that high, right? Right. Um, Right. Well, and honestly, like, I got into this kind of work because I wanted, because I just needed to have a job. Mm -hmm. Like, really, I moved here in 1998, and I just wanted to get a job so I could stop worrying about work and make art. I just needed a day job. I just needed a day job. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I mean, it was uh, 10 years, <laughs> 15 years of like all of these different things to get to a day job. You know, I mean, it was it, like, it was kind of crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, um, when you're on that anyway, course, that, yeah, that, you know, that can, can become, best, right? that can become all of your time and all of your energy, just trying to get like the basics, you know, established. Um, and then telling yourself like, oh, but then I'll go make art. And um, so anyway. Have you ever seen a Francis Bacon painting? Yeah. Really? Yeah. He's my favorite painter, but I've never seen any of his paintings. Yeah. That's Which one did a, you see? Um, there, oh boy. I'm picturing, well, I think we have one that's a, I think we have one in the collection here that's a gorilla here? head. Uh, not here, here in the oh. museum right now, but I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write it down and I'll check the database and see which ones we have here. 
and if any of them are going on view and then I can let you know. But I, um, yeah, I feel like I saw a retrospective of his, um, I want to maybe say in London. I remember seeing like a few different ones of his and, um, there was a, there was a three, there was a three paneled self portrait maybe. Um, and there was a portrait of his lover and there was a portrait of him and I can't remember which one was the three panel. Um, but it was cool with the, like, you know, with his three panel ones, cause there's so much like weird movement in his yeah. paintings, just even the, in a, in a single painting. So this, I mean, it was almost like watching a movie, mm -hmm. seeing all three of them together. Yeah. Was it like the bluish yellow, yellowish one? I think that's the three panel that I have like my They all look like, desktop. when I think of Francis Bacon, I always think of like, like basically like flesh tones and meat tones mm -hmm. on blue. Like that's like, I'm picturing all of them and I know that's not totally accurate, but, um. But yeah, yeah. Why do you ask about Francis Bacon? Just because you love him just so much? Just my favorite. Yeah. Just, I love his Wow, paintings. interesting. Yeah. yeah. What um, do you love about him? I just love artists that I feel like are daring. I think also just me personally, it's like first year of college and those two years um, when it was a pandemic and I was in high school, uh, I really want to be an artist. So I was just making music. But man, it's like, you know, I want to do the whole thing, right? But yeah, I was producing, I was audio engineering, but I just couldn't get myself to like record music. Huh. And that's something that I've sort of just started to build up the courage now. And it's something I want to tackle next year. Yeah. And it's interesting too, seeing the way the podcast has affected sort of my confidence to take on creative pursuits. Cause I was another, like how we were talking about earlier, that was like another bird that I was trying to kill with this like podcast stone, right? It was just like, give myself the confidence that I can ex execute in a creative pursuit to sort of like start introducing um, recording music in the future and I think you know that goes to the artists that I love and enjoy the most you know it's just like Francis it just seemed like that's a guy that had um, all the confidence in the world and expressing himself no matter how uncomfortable or um, dark yeah. you know what he wanted to express was and that's something that I wish I had and I'm working on developing and you um, know um, yeah. I'm just remembering a real aha moment that I had uh, when I went up to see the John Singer Sargent exhibit that they had up at the Legion of Honor um, I love John Singer Sargent. His paintings are so beautiful. Um, but he, uh, you know, I, I was, I studied painting and he was kind of one of the pinnacles for me of like, man, if I could paint like that, like if I could see, if I could see like that mm -hmm. and then be able to render that, like that's like, that's one of the top ones for me. Right. And but going through that exhibit, what I thought was so interesting was because they didn't have a lot of his like really famous paintings, um, it was a lot of just like sketches and studies and like watching him like, you know, move through um, different parts of Spain and things like that. It, I realized it's never about trying to paint like the people. It's never about trying to paint like that person. It's about learning their process mm -hmm. and I was like oh his process is you bring a sketchbook everywhere you go you draw whatever is in front of you you start to like develop like you develop your eye just with the with the exercises and then you will come up with your own visual language like I don't really want to paint exactly like John Singer Sargent but I think like, or like, you know, like you look at, you flip through a Gustav Klimt book and you're like, how could I ever? But if you just, if you study artist processes, you will, I think you, I think it's much more liberating mm -hmm. than trying to look through a book of like, you know, all of his totally, you know, earth smashing paintings and, and being like, well, if I, if I paint more like this, I'll be better. It's like, it really, it was about, oh, I just have to follow his process and yeah. the way he worked and the way he like built up what he was doing. So. Yeah. And then if you want to get even crazier, you mix processes. And if you want to get even oh, crazier, you just have your own process sure. and you just venture sure. out. Yeah. I mean, and somewhere out of there, like, you know, that great John Coulter, not Joe, sorry, Miles Davis line where he says, you know, it took me a long time to um, learn to play like myself. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you do, you follow, you know, you follow the masters and then you, through that you you know you create your own voice that's the thing i think i struggled with whenever i'd like try to record myself was just like oh this doesn't feel like myself uh -huh. and i felt like every um every like feeling of incompetence or like less than that i had throughout my life would like congregate itself <gasps> when i was in the microphone yeah. and that's why like i view that pursuit as like you know i have my majors in finance i could just go work in finance that's like the comfortable thing i could do yeah but like regardless whether it's a hobby or my career i have to like conquer that because i think i view that sort of like the hill of like all my negative feelings about myself is like that's the hill that needs to be climbed and like that's another thing that i feel like art um at least in my personal experience has like 
given me the opportunity to sort of like congregate a lot of those negative emotions and sort of like conquer them in that way. I kind of view that like finishing projects. Like I wonder if a lot of our other artists feel that way. Like when they finish a painting, it's sort of like conquered or maybe processed or healed from any emotions they had. Yeah. Um, or if they finish an album or if they finish a song. That's another thing too with Francis Bacon. It, like, I don't know, I can't have a conversation with the guy, but a lot of those paintings sort of give off that vibe. The same way like when I think about uh, Donda, I know I'm bringing up Kanye again, but like that's what that album is to me, right? Yeah. It's like he was dealing with so much. Yeah. And then that album was sort of like the release of all those emotions. Sure, um, yeah. About his mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now having this conversation, I feel like I'm starting to like, Cool. make a lot of those um connections i'm also curious too if you could just kind of speak to the sure. artwork preservation process like mm-hmm. a, a lot of these paintings are they things that can be preserved for like the next thousand years or maybe that's shorter such lifespan? A good, that's such a good question that's such a good question um there's there's three things that i'll say about that um yes we have a conservation team there are people here who have been trained to um you know, fix a painting if it gets damaged to make it look exactly the way it was before. There Mm -hmm. is that type of of conservation and preservation. And they're painting over? Um, Could be filling in. Oh, okay. If, you know, if you imagine like a painting gets like a a scratch in it that you might just be filling in. Um, Yeah, that's a whole course of study that um, people go to a lot of school to learn. Um, There's also the type of preservation where you are, which we, which our conservation study department really focuses on here, which is to um, to study the artist's intent, and so letting that inform what kind of you know. Let's just use the word invasive treatment that you do or don't use. If the artist feels that you know, especially with modern and contemporary art, right? There's a lot of weird stuff out there, <laughs> like things that do not fit into any simple category. Mm -hmm. Um, We break them into um, painting, um, objects, photo, and media. I think those are our four sort of top categories. So, but you might have a piece that has all of those components in it because it's contemporary art. And so what we need to know is about what, what is the artist's intent? So if, you know, there's this great story. It, this is going way back just because I can't think of a current example. But um, Duchamp made this big piece on glass. And then when it was getting moved, it um, got, it, it, it cracked. They bumped it and it cracked. And, and they said, oh, Mr. Duchamp, we're so sorry. Um, it's, you know, your work has been damaged. And he, and he came out and he looked at it and he said, fine, perfect, it's finished. Mm. You know, so artist's intent informs what we do or don't do. And then there's also, um, <laughs> there's people that may listen to this podcast and know that I'm taking this right from a workshop that I went went to, but I was really inspired by it, which is um, when you are dealing with certain kinds of artwork, especially time-based media artwork, the point of um, intervention to care for that piece and to understand what that piece needs is at the moment that it's installed. Um, because you can't, if you open up a box with all of the components, it's not going to tell you whether that piece can still run or not. So there's a lot of when you pull artworks out, making sure that you're doing all of the things that you do for that you need to do for them when they're out. Because um, especially with time-based media and the way that um, that technologies change. If you open up a, if you don't open up a piece for ten years, the technology may change, and you may not be able to convert it any, mm-hmm. to to another medium that then can be still watched. Um, one of the, the other one of the fascinating facts they talked about was that by I think it was like 2025, 2028, something like that, you're not going to be able to get a VHS video player anymore. There just aren't going to be any. Like, like in manufacturing or just, you know. Yeah, anymore? like they're gonna they're not going to manufacture them anymore mm-hmm. and that the secondary market will be depleted. That was from, I think, the um, National Archives put out a statement about that. So if you have a time-based media piece that is, that is stored on VHS video and you don't look at it for 15 years, in the time that you didn't look at it, the technology will have gone obsolete and you may not have an opportunity to transform it to a new form of media like have an mp4 on a computer or something. exactly or you know or or upload it onto a cloud on a digital database somewhere um so one of the things they're trying to do now is to make sure that things are stored in multiple places in multiple formats mm-hmm. but um 
So those are sort of the three ways that we do preservation work. Uh, we try to we try to gather as much as we can when we pull things out. Um, people take this in different ways, but um, most museums, including us, only have a fraction of our artwork out on view at any given time. So there are thousands of works that um, if we had a, maybe if we had a staff of 1,500 who were only dedicated to, you know, conservation and treatment and preservation and collections care, we would be able to pull out every single work and make sure that it's stored properly and make sure that the type of foam that they used to use back in 1982 hasn't deteriorated or something like that. Like, um, so a lot of what stops a lot of what's in the archives from being displayed is just the need for people to do maintenance on them. And it can them. be that um, it can also be um, whether, um, you know, a lot of the things that inform and this is, it's good that we're getting to this because I know this was part of your questions about exhibitions, too, is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, what we put on exhibit and what we pull is basically informed by the curators and their courses of study. Um, one of the things I try to flag a lot is, um, one thing is, is if an artist is recently passed away, I'll um, go into the database and see, you know, do we have good images of their artwork? Because if someone passes away, it's often a time when maybe in the next year, we're going to start getting requests for loans because somebody wants to do a ret retrospective. Um, a couple of years ago, it was the 100th anniversary of surrealism. And so all of a sudden, you've got all of these requests for works by surrealists. And so, and those are the ones that you're going to pull them out and take a look at them. So maybe it's just about making sure that the database is updated. We, you know, we've got good condition reports. We've got, um, you know, we've got good installation notes if the work is complicated. And then pulling the work out and having the conservator look at it and see, you know, does it need treatment? Does it need to be cleaned before it's imaged? If it does need treatment, how long is it going to take? Who's going to pay for that? Those sorts of things. And so, um, and then also like I get external, uh, external researchers coming in and, you know, maybe they're working on their, their thesis or their PhD or something, and they're studying this artist and they want to see all the artwork. Well, if, if somebody's doing research on it, there's a good chance that they're going to end up in the field somewhere Maybe in five years from now, that person is going to, you know, maybe their career trajectory is that they're going to go and be a curator. Okay, so then that means that probably their pet project from their PhD is going to resurface. And so making sure that in those moments um, that when it, even if it's an external researcher who's, you know, or even like a master's student or a bachelor's student or something like that, like there would be, it would be easy to sort of dismiss that research as like, oh, it's just some student, but who knows where that student is going to be and who is going to, who are going to be the leaders in curatorial research later. So I just always try to take a pause and, and make sure that we have this work fully represented in all the ways um, that we should for, you know, good sort of collections care. Um, cause I think it's going to probably come up later. Somebody's mm -hmm. talking about it for some reason. There was a desire for that. So it's really, one of the really cool things, um, that I get to experience doing the podcast is, you know, have an incredibly diverse range of guests and hearing, uh, the, you and the emphasis on uh, artist intent, it reminded me of this musicologist I had on a couple weeks ago and the importance in musicology of artist intent. Whereas, you know, like how someone's going to play Beethoven, there has to be a lot of like assumptions or guesses made as to like how right. certain compositions were played back then. Uh -huh. And it makes for this like really dynamic and like colorful um, thing in like the industry where everyone's sort of guessing and that sort of like offers the opportunity for the person who's playing to sort of like give their take. Right. Or uh, maybe just like instill a little bit of variation uh -huh. um, in, in the way that's sort of expressed. Is that something that's sort of like really present in the way, you know, art is preserved where people have to kind of take guesses as to how the artist would intend to express themselves and then maybe the way that might obscure or uh, bring new life to, to paintings that are displayed? Yeah, and it's really interesting you ask that question in the context of music because um, because that's sort of, in. I'm thinking about Solowitz's work and how... Um, he creates essentially an, a composition piece. Mm -hmm. He creates the, the, the direction of the wall drawing, and then it's up to other people to render it, which is really very similar to a composer writing a piece and then a, you know, um, a, 
a maestro, I can't say the word, um, a musical director, let's just call it that, because uh, mm-hmm. I can't say the word right now, um, or like the orchestra interpreting that music, right? And there's not a, a ton of room for with his drawings for interpretation. I mean, they're pretty specific, but ultimately it's going to be a different hand creating it every time. Um, I, th- I think that what we try to do is... Um, with contemporary artists getting as much information out of them while they're still here, especially at the moment of um, when we uh, acquire the piece, because um, an artist gets very, probably gets, I'm I'm assuming that an artist would get pretty excited when they Mm -hmm. find out that a museum is going to take their piece. So they're most interested in talking about that piece at that moment of acquisition. Right. Um, And so, you know, we've, we've all seen, I'm sure you've seen this in music where like artists move on. Right. And so they don't necessarily want to come back and rethink the theory that they were working under when they created that piece. Andre 3000. Andre 3000. Right. He's like, I don't know, whatever that was, you know, or like, you know, I mean, I'm sure that Bob Dylan deals with this all the time. Like people want to talk to him about subterranean homesick blues. And he's like, haven't thought about that album in, decades right Mm -hmm. so wanting to capture the moment of acquisition wanting to capture the moment um when the artist is you know if we're going to acquire a piece in a body of work wanting to make sure that we're capturing as much from the artist as we can next step is the artist studio if the artist isn't around anymore artist studio might have information you know you've got you've got several artists who you know maintain the collection and the archives of someone who's passed away um and I mean, I, my guess is, is that, you know, when you look at something like, um, uh, we, we don't have a lot of old work here because we're a modern and contemporary museum. But, you know, if you went and looked at something that was probably from like late 1800s, or the 1900s, a lot of paintings were made exactly the same way back then. There wasn't a lot of divergence in mm-hmm. in how people created paintings. So if you know how to take care of one Vermeer, you probably know how to take care of all the Vermeers. And there's and there's a lot of scholarly information around that. There's a lot of research you can do. Um, I think the farther we've gotten to the point we're at now, the more there's a more of a pressing need to get the get the word straight from the artist's mouth um, while they're still thinking about it. Yeah. Did and I answer the question? For sure. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think maybe something that helps that cause is, you know, there's so much access to like social media and interviews. So mm-hmm. there's so much more information to sort of uh, gauge. It's so interesting. It seems, I don't know if like anthropological is the right word, mm-hmm. the right way to use the word, but it does yeah. seem very anthropological. Like, yeah. The, the sort of like exploration of who the artist is and the consideration, um, you know, that, that it, that's taken when you're preserving their art. I'm curious if you could maybe walk us through the process of planning and executing exhibits. Um. Yeah, so um, I haven't I haven't worked directly with exhibits in a in a while. Um, I mean, I do because I you know I I handle access to the collection, so that's sort of where my main focus is. Um, if I had more bandwidth, I would think more about what happens when it actually gets up here at the museum. But I, you know, I try my best. Um, basically, um, there are so there are loans, and then there are exhibits. There's zi- exhibits that we do here, and then there's works that we loan out, which are also exhibitions, mm-hmm. right? So somebody's doing an ex- exhibition on Matisse in another country. We could ma- they may That's be other ask- museums. another museum may okay. be asking us for a loan. So there's sort of two already sort of two trajectories. And that museum pays interest to SF MoMA? Or? The, that museum would pay the cost of borrowing the piece, okay. including, you know, um, any new housing that needs to get built, um, shipment, uh, things like that. And then they also pay like a, all things considered a pretty nominal um, uh, administrative fee mm-hmm. to handle the the paperwork of it. Um, and so those, so, and so those are going on in both directions, right? We've got an exhibit here and we want to borrow somebody's stuff. And so we're sending out requests and then other people are planning exhibits and they're asking for things from us. Um, also, if a curator has a sparkle in their eye about something they might want to do, they may send out messages to other curators they know and say, I'm thinking about this concept for an exhibit, you know, um, 
what do you think? What do you have in your collection? I mean, there are ways that you can research those things, but put and then but and also sort of sending out the message of like, I've got this concept for an exhibit. You may want to have it as a venue. You may want to be a venue for that exhibit. But if nothing else, like please don't conceive of the same idea because I'm working on it right now. And then you're going to be in competition for resources mm -hmm. because everybody's going to want the Andy Warhol, Liza Minnelli piece or something like that. Like you don't want to be, you know, fighting each other for the same things. And there's also a collegial relationship there too, where um, if we loan something to another institution and then they ask us for something, we might say, well, they helped us out so much with that exhibit that we were working on. Okay, we're going to do what we can to make sure that this loan happens. So um, exhibitions and loans, um, Always the more time that you have, the better. Um, exhibition calendar is planned out, you know, maybe about 10 years, or five years in advance, something like that, like on paper. But there could be conceptions for things that are happening even beyond that. Um, loans tend to be, we tend to hear about them um, later in the game because somebody has been conceiving of this. They've put together a list of what they'd like to get and that's when they start sending out letters and seeing what they can get for their exhibit. So um, <sighs> we have a minimum of, I think it's maybe I think 15 months. We'd like to know 15 months in advance if you want to see a piece. Um, often it's shorter than that. Sometimes it's longer than that. Um, so if curator will begin working on their exhibit five years in advance? Yeah. Wow. And curators, I mean, but curators like artists live mm -hmm. in a place where they are, they are immersed in a topic and they are always thinking about what that topic has to say. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're always researching. They're always studying new works there. You know, so so if you think about something like a group show, if you have a, a concept of like something that's going on right now in the world, like there's an exhibit up at the museum right now called What Matters. And 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 to me, I, I haven't read the curatorial statement, but to me, that exhibit is about, well, what really matters right now? Right. So that's the concept. And then the then the curators, you know, they're going to artist studios, they're going to art fairs, they're going to other museums, they're visiting other exhibits and they're they're putting together this concept and they're sort of it's like they're solving a problem of like, well, what would that look like then if I created an exhibit that had this as a central theme? Or if it's a single artist and they're going to do some kind of exhibit about a single artist, they'll there will be like a certain point of view that they're going to speak to about that artist and it and it generally generally the idea is that they're going to say that there's um not exactly new research but that they're going to say something that people haven't really thought about before in regards to that artist so they're they're working kind of all the time on everything all at once um mm -hmm. and then yeah, and then it, you know, typically it's getting on paper, starts to get on paper and starts to get mapped out let's say two to five years in advance. I mean, and then once you're into two years ahead of time, that's when you need to start knowing what it's going to actually look like and what the checklist is actually going to be and who we're borrowing it from. And because, you know, we're also dealing with things like, you know, museum budgets and, and f fiscal years and things like that. Like if you think you're going to ship a piece that's eight tons from Japan next year, like we need to work that into um, the budget. We need to work that into our storage planning. So it's like you kind of like, like I said, like the more notice that you give, the better. So yeah, by by one to two years, it, it pretty much needs to be mapped out and we need to be talking about where it's going to go, what kind of fabrication needs to be done for the gallery itself. You know, are we going to have to build out a false ceiling? Are we going to need to, are things going to be inset in the walls? Um, there's just such a number. I mean, with a, with a place this size and the types of exhibits we do, there's just so many people and so many, um, yeah, just so many ripples to any decision that it really has to be um, planned out. So is there like a schedule for like the exhibits we can expect SFM would have for the next three, four, five years? Yeah, like definitely oh, wow. the next three. <laughs> um, it's not public, um, mm. but it's, but it's, always under review mm. um and the parts are kind of always moving until we get to the point i mean the parts are always moving um trying to make it all work together and balancing um you know staff and resources and money and space and all of those things one of the things i was thinking about on the muni ride over here was 
I think given different people's socioeconomic status, they're taught how to appreciate art in different ways. Meaning Absolutely. people on like lower socioeconomic uh, standing, they might have the opportunity to learn how to appreciate a movie, right? Mm -hmm. But they may not understand maybe the function of a museum or sort of mm -hmm. like the background or what really is going on when you go to an exhibit. It's crazy hearing that like an exhibit is something that's worked on for five years because my sort of thinking was like, oh, I am guess like a museum has a bunch of paintings and then a curator kind of comes in and it's like, oh, let's plan this for next quarter and next quarter. Sure. And it was sort of like a, something that wasn't given that amount of like effort and thought to. Um, if for, for, those, for those people in the audience who may not be familiar with sort of like the function of a museum, how would you describe, or maybe if you could like offer us a framework of thinking, how should we think about a museum? How should we think about appreciating art in a museum? Maybe that's not the best way to word right. it, but how should we think about like, okay, I live in the Bay Area, SF MoMA is here. Right. What is an exhibit? What would be the best way for me to fit sort of SF MoMA into like my art consumption right. Um, right. diet, so to speak? Right. Um, that is such a fabulous question. That is, and it's one that I think about a lot. Um, I think that um, I think that one of the things we are lacking in here is um, in the United States, in particular, is that we don't introduce kids to art um, as a place. Like the way we introduce kids to a library, like yeah this is your library and you can just come here and like, this is a place for you. And this is the stuff, you know, these are the books and, and you, but you can go in any section you want. It's a public space. I mean, museums are supposed to be public spaces. They are, we are stewards of a collection. We hold the collection and care for the collection on behalf of the public. That's why museums get tax breaks. That's why we are a nonprofit organization because we are, we are doing a public service. And so, um, so are the paintings like assets of the public? Sort of think about that. They oh, that's a great question. I I don't I don't. Mm, I would have to ask legal team what that what exactly the relationship is. But museums are they are stewards of a collection on behalf of the public, and I'm not sure if I can explain it any better than that. Um, but I think that we treat museums like a place that's like, I mean, for one thing, it's expensive. So it's not, um, it's not as cheap as going to, although movies are pretty expensive now too, but you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's still more expensive than a movie. Um, and um, I think that we don't introduce people to it soon enough. And I think that there's also a big divide where people think that there's, they are supposed to know something before they come in here. And I think it's, 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 there's, there's a, there's sort of an idea. And I think that both museum professionals and the public feed into this in their own way that like, oh, but if you don't know what that painting is about, like, it's not a, like, you know, you look at a beautiful landscape, you can just look at a beautiful landscape and love it because you think it's a beautiful landscape. That's fine. You can look at some, something that's totally off the hook and, and go, I don't know what that is. It's the uncertainty again. People feel like they come in here and they're supposed to be certain about everything. You go to the, you know, a zoo is a type of museum. Mm. People go to a zoo. They're like, I know what a gorilla is. I can go and look at a gorilla and I know exactly what I'm supposed to be thinking about a gorilla. And maybe I'll learn something new about a gorilla. But people come to museums, and I, and I think that museums do this too, that we, we have this sort of, you know, we got these white walls and these little, little tags on the wall that say like one or two things about the artist. Um, a lot of times the writing is very difficult if you're not like steeped in that language. Um, it's hard because they have to be short. And so um, it's hard to be concise about a big, you know, a larger idea and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like people uh, like, to me, it's it's about people just knowing that, like, no, this is actually a place for you, too. Like, just don't touch it, the art, okay, because we're not supposed to touch the art because that's bad for it. And I can tell you why it's bad for it, too. But, like, like you know, in France, every preschool, well, first of all, they have, you know, national, nationally paid preschool. But preschools all go to museums all day long. Every you know, There's constantly just a flow of, like, three- and four-year-olds parading through museums there's there's the idea that this is a place this is it's a place where families go on the weekend and it's just something you do and so um i think there's like there's not a normalization of it and i think that there are hindrances i think that the 
historically museums were for a certain group of people and i think that's just been really hard to dismantle because the whole the whole system got built up like around that like all of the jobs and the way we lay them out and the hours that they're open and all of those things were mapped out with an old idea in mind and we've just sort of carried that on it's like how we've finally discovered that um lecturing at somebody isn't the best way to learn something Mm -hmm. But we really haven't, we still haven't actually changed education, though. It's like we know better, but we haven't really changed how we do it. Um, I think that's also a really amazing place for artists to step in and show us what that could look like. Um, and so, yeah, I think these are, these should be public spaces. There's so um, many things I want to touch on in your answer. Yeah. I had on the director of the Latinx Student Center uh -huh. on the, the podcast a couple weeks ago. For, at State? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, have you met him? No, but I love it. I love just I love the whole student center there and everything yeah. that they do. So yeah, yeah, it was really cool um, hearing his experience. He grew up, uh, I think, in Hunters Point in San Francisco, but mm -hmm. um, you know, grew up from in low income background. Uh, high school was uh, pretty challenging for him, but he went to UC Davis and he was talking to me about his struggle, sort of like fitting in or feeling mm -hmm. as if though. Um, I think the best ex the way I could explain it is he should have shared this experience of like, oh, when I went to the quad at UC Davis, it was like for the first time I could just sort of like leave my laptop in my backpack and like not fear it being taken, right? Right. And that was sort of like a shock experience for him. And one of the things I think about, you know, I feel very fortunate. Uh, my parents made it a point, me growing up, to, to make sure to uh, make the emphasis on like travel and new experiences really, really clear to me and my sister. So, nice. you know, every single summer, whether it was just a road trip or it was a trip to like Europe or Southern America, it was like saving up to go travel was of the utmost importance to them, right? Yeah. And I remember, you know, I went to high school in uh, Central Richmond and so many of my friends had never just been to like a museum or yeah. been to like sites that people pay tons of money to come to San Francisco from all over the world to like see. Um, and I think your point about how a lot of this stuff needs to sort of be conditioned to kids and maybe kids from uh, more affluent school districts get more um, trips to museums. So that implicit in that um, sort of like experience or reality is that those kids, it's communicated to them that this is a place for you to come mm -hmm. the same way, you know, going to a library or another public place. But for those kids who don't have, you know, those types of field trips to those places, yeah. implicit in that is, you know, you're sort of communicating to those kids that this isn't a place maybe for you to be or maybe, you know, it is a place for you to go, but it isn't something that you could just um, sort of like enjoy. You're never really taught how you're supposed to enjoy it. Um, and one of the things that came up a lot when I had conversations with my friends who had never been to museums was, yeah, but like, you know, why don't, if I want to see a painting, why don't I just like look at a picture of it? And it's like, no, man, like, think about it. Like, why do you like going to a basketball game or a football game? It's like, you can watch it on TV, right. but there's something to be said about the experience of like being in there and what ideas that might inspire, what co conversations you might have with people that you go to those places. Same thing with, you know, concerts, mm -hmm. um, or even movies, you know, it's like, if a movie, you know, you could watch it on your laptop, you could go to a movie theater and watch it. You could go to maybe like the premiere, right? But like all those different like levels of like experience, there's so much insight to be drawn from those types of experiences. But I never really saw that communicated with, um, yeah. you know, my peers who weren't as fortunate to have parents that like made it, you know, a point to communicate made it that with Made a priority, them. sure. Yeah. 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 It, um, yeah. And it's interesting. Like I, you know, when we, when we first opened, when we were reopening in 2016 after the expansion, um, one of the guards, we were, you know, talking to the guards about, um, you know, watching people, watching bags, making sure people don't touch things. And um, one of the guards asked, well, what if they buy it? Then can they then can they touch it, though? I mean, they got to They got to touch it to walk it to like carry it out. Right. And she didn't understand that these paintings weren't for sale. She didn't understand that these were just for looking at. Mm -hmm. And. And like my heart just broke. I was like we have failed people. If we have people, grown adults, who don't know that this is not a, a retail space, we have done something, like we have really missed something here. Like we are not doing our jobs. And mm -hmm. like, you know, and I think about it a lot too, because like I live, I live in the Bayview. It's, you know, right off of Third Street. Third Street comes right, to, our address is on Third Street. I'm like, what? is happening between where I live and here 
like it's just two totally different words. Why, why is why are those people that are right at the other end of the T line not coming here? Like what what is the block? And I think it is about I think it's primarily about how we condition people and their expectations about what they're entitled to or not. Um, and then also just like you know when people say, well, I could just look at a painting and book. I'm like, it's different. I'm just, I'm not going to make you any promises about what you're going to experience, but I guarantee you it's going to be different to stand in front of a painting than looking at one in a book, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. And, you know, we're getting into bigger issues of just like social disparity and, you know, um, you know, the, the, the inequality that happens between, schools and between what's being offered to students in schools and things like that um that i don't know that any one museum can solve but uh but if you want to have a public in the future that's going to support your museum and come and visit you you have to you know you you have to start cultivating them somewhere yeah. um because if you i mean and this is extreme and it might sound a little harsh but like if you're only going to rely if if we're going to keep if we're going to keep stratify, stratifying our our you know our classes and you're going to and only the 1% is going to come to museums that's not going to be enough people to come to a museum it's going to be a really small if only the kids of the of this little tiny fraction of society is learning that this is a place for them the chances that we are going to have enough adults when that generation grows up to to you know, patronize a museum and make this all worthwhile. Um, it's pretty slim. Yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure to set aside some time in our conversation to cover some of the artists you resonate with. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I totally. know you provided a couple of names, Deborah Roberts, mm. uh, which large scale collages, uh, towards the end you provided uh, Tara Daly. Tara Daly. Tara yeah. Daly. Uh, yeah. her ceramics were so cool. Like I really, mm. um, enjoyed looking into those. I also like Lorna Simpson's, um, work with like stacks of uh, sculptures and magazines. Yeah. Um, and Glass, maybe if you could speak to, you know, why, what about those artists maybe resonates with you mm. and what their art has maybe taught you? Yeah, well, I mean, I call it, you know, I think when we first talked, I, I call them art crushes because, um, you know, they're my crush right now. And I'll always love them, but I might be onto somebody else in mm -hmm. a couple of months. Um, but Deborah Roberts has really held on for me um, because I like, I like collage a lot. Um, I love that she uses her own, she does her own painting and drawing in the collages. So she's mixing components, which um, is a lot harder to do. I do collage and like, that's a lot harder to do than you'd think it is. Like, it seems like, oh yeah, I'll just, but anyway, she, um, what she's doing is hard. The, the end product is beautiful and that her underlying message is about um, seeing black children as children. It's about allowing them to have childhood. And I, and I think, you know, I mean, black children as the canary in the coal mine, I think that we don't, I think that we have a real lack of understanding child development and the developing mind and understanding that these are not, these are neither small adults, nor are they just a sidekick for you to like dress up or mm -hmm play out whatever f issues you have from your own childhood because you always wanted to be a ballerina so you're going to force your child to be a ballerina like all of these things play into not respecting childhood and so um i really like kids i did some teaching um kind of always think about what would have things have been like if i had kept teaching um i just i think they're awesome and so anyway i like i like it a lot um yeah, so that's kind of why. I mean, it's it's like it's like the the craftsmanship coupled with the message um, just really nails it for me. Um, Lorna Simpson and Ellen Gallagher both um, accomplished. I mean, they've both gone on to do many things, but both of them very accomplished collage artists as well. Um, and then, and I think I just uh, and then Tara Daly. I you know she's unlike a lot of. So she does, she works in a few different things. She does um, painting and she also does ceramics and she does a few different types of ceramics and then everything sort of mixes and mingles together. Um, but I just really, um, with, you know, and what I was saying before about how like, it's okay to just come into a museum and not know what it's supposed to mean. And just like, 
I don't know, man. I just look at Tara stuff and I like it. I like how it makes me feel mm -hmm. when I look at it. Um, there are, there's in some of her more figurative uh, ceramic sculptures, there's, um, there's some mythologies and like things where she's drawing on old mythological stories to tie into um, some of the problems we've got with the world today. And she would obviously be much more accomplished at talking about that than I am. But um but I, every, I love what she's saying. And I think it, maybe that's the similarity with Deborah Roberts. I love the execution. Like, for me, it's beautiful. And then also, there are messages underneath it um, that are things that I like to think about and that, um, that I feel strongly about. So Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Um, yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. This totally, is the last yeah. question. Okay. I wanted to ask you, if you were 20 years old at this current mm -hmm. moment, what problems would you aim to solve? Oh, that man, I kept thinking about that and I kept thinking about it. Um, I would, I, I, I have to say, um, and I, maybe this is, maybe this is a good organic answer. Cause I think it's supposed to be some big statement about art or something. Um, but you know, Sinead O'Connor died recently. And so there was a lot about her in the media and one of, and I was a big fan. Um, and one of the things that she, or one of the quotes that I read, um, you know, w cause there's a big flurry of things about her. She said at one point that all of the world's problems, um, started with child abuse. Mm. And she was like, we could solve everything if we would just stop messing with kids and mess messing them up at a really young age. And I mean, and kind of like what we've been talking about, like if we would, cultivate creativity if we would cultivate the understanding that art is for you if we would you know um if we'd understand that the child is developing their mind and that like like that we all have we all have responsibilities as adults to um i feel and this is a personal opinion i know some people are like ah you decide to have a kid it's your problem but like we we all have to make a world because that's the, those are the people if, okay even if you want to look at it on a completely se selfish level mm -hmm. those are the people that are going to be caring for you when you're old do you want them to be good human beings or do you not care that they're going to be bad human beings like and then on a bigger scale like that's that's literally the future every cliche about the children being the future like that's the truth they will be running the world you give them 15 20 years that's what the world's going to look like mm -hmm. so i would like to shape that in a way that is positive and makes them feel good about being here and encourages them to you know I'm one of the things I always write on cards when friends have babies is like I can't wait to see what you do with the world I'm here to help let me know what I can do you know um I I feel like that's a key and and then that informs sort of everything right it informs education it informs um public transportation it informs everything like thinking about the future and you know that's a that's a very concrete example of what the future is going to look like is every kid. So um, that's kind of one of my big, big things. Yeah. One idea that I've sort of toyed with was I wonder if like in the future there could be a public health program that gives every kid an operating manual for like themselves. And one of the things that I've th sort of thought about was like if we see this field recorder when I bought it, it came with an operating manual. Right. Right. And like we're all born with a certain type of psychology. Some of us are more agreeable. Some of us are more disagreeable and sort of like all the different builds that human beings can come in come with their advantages and disadvantages. Right. But none of that is ever really communicated with kids. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, if I had to guess, the only people probably around in the world that have at least a basic understanding of what their operating manual might look like are people that have had, you know, like psychological services or had that yeah. um, available to them. And I've been able to go to therapy and have tests done. Um, and I wonder, like, you know, when we talk about fostering um, a better upbringing for a lot of young people, like, if that would be something that's like feasible mm. in the future, you know? Yeah, reliable mental health uh, would really go a long way. I had a friend who said that we should all be issued therapists at age 11. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, that really, that would really help. I mean, I think, I think one of the big challenges we're dealing with right now is just um, coming to an agreement of what is the best thing. Um, there seems to be a lot of arguments about what that is right now. Yeah. Um, so, um, it's tough, but I love your idea. Mm -hmm. I love your idea. And maybe if you just offer it, you know, I mean, one of the things I think that was great was that I found out when my son turned 13, um, 
he manages his own um, in like the, the his portal on the insurance company. Mm. He manages that after 13. I was like, I feel like I've got a pretty good relationship with my son. I feel like we're pretty honest about things. But if you were a, a 13 year old in a situation where you had parents that were not accepting of who you are or you needed help that your parents were refusing to help you get, the fact that you start to have that kind of autonomy at 13, that you could go ask a medical professional a question about your body or whatever you need and get an actual scientific answer, and that, you know, that that's a private conversation between you to some degree at age 13, but that that's a private conversation or that you could request that. Like, just maybe you just hand it to them and let them know it's there, you know? Mm -hmm. This is the phone number you call if you need some help. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Nancy, thank you so much Absolutely. for being on Atlas today. I this really was so enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to get to know you better. Great, likewise. Yeah, totally. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.